So our next speaker is uh, Shepnan Shemene, who's going to talk about, uh, the title is Anastasia, Speaking Her Silence. Shepnan Shemene. Just over a century ago, Nasimina, the Pearl of the Levant, my grandmother, as a young girl, embroidered her bridal bed sheets. Ever since I have had my own room, I carried them with me. First, in this, is from Izmir to Istanbul, then from Istanbul to New York, then from New York to Rome, and from Rome now to London. Two years ago, I reached into closet where I kept them and something felt different. I felt a quiver, suddenly embroidery came snapped into focus for the first time. Um, these sheets are actually quite an example of my grandmother's embroidery. They're called in the style of Brother Young Les, which has these holes and holes makes flowers, different patterns. Uh, stems and um, and they are called airlets. And uh, I could, when I looked at them, I always see my grandmother's tiny, tiny hands. She had very small hands, and um, I can recognize um, her style. Actually, her own personality. It's often uh, mellow, spacious, gentle, stately, and um, delicate. And in her stitches are meticulous and obsessive sense of perfection they reflect. And it's quite an intimate work. And time to time, you can see she goes free. One letter is totally different than the same letter again once she repeats them. But I also must tell you that she was a musical person. So uh, she played the violin. She lullabied my mother and uh, my uncle to sleep with it. So also she filled our Beijing or Starfield evenings, idle moments with her Zimmer Neika, quite unique sound to Izmir. And she made us dance to her own Rebetiko. So maybe I later understood there was a little bit of rebellious spirit in her. So uh, my memory of her makes art of her sounds as well. So when I look at these stitches, I see her singing to herself dreaming of her future love. And um, so the, those little flowers, those little drops, are maybe dew drops, and maybe perhaps tears. And, uh, and also there is this whole thing, she's ready to get married. She's, she's, it's almost like spread on that cotton, like comfort in the whole thing, and, and uh, joyfulness in it. So then I go, what about the letters? Asked my mother. And my mother, as if I'm cute, always gives me the same answer. With this curiosity, to silence my curiosity, she says, ah, there you go again. Well, I told you, they were the fashion of your grandmother's time. They're called majuscule. It's just the design. So the hypnotic tone of my mom, as she rounds her word, Majuscule sounds so sophisticated and French that I went quiet every time she said that. Of course, until the next time. But I never thought how majuscule calligraphic style, commonly used only from 4th to 8th century AD by Latin and Greek scribes who wrote entirely in capital letters, could become the fashion of the time in 1930s a Turkish Izmir on the Aegean coast was a follow-up question, obviously, but I never dared to ask. So clearly these designs were as obscure to my mom as they are obscure to me. They were obscure to me. So uh, also when I looked at them, although I'm quite curious and I made a couple of attempts to learn Greek alphabet, somehow there was something that I didn't get in the right way. So I, I hold them upside down 
and I didn't realize. And uh, uh, so I looked at all the alphabets there is with this position, and they didn't fit to Greek, they didn't fit to Cyrillic, neither Arabic, nor even Aramaic or Hebrew. So then one summer, that summer in 2016, I took a picture of them. But this time, I took the picture inadvertently. <laughs> so anyway, I took the picture somehow in the right way, which I didn't realize really. And then um, I took that photograph and published it in my column uh, on T24, I write the Sunday column. And I asked my readers if they recognized them. Of course, because it was the right way, the answer came right away in two seconds. And a, a woman, a graphic designer from Istanbul, who is actually of Jewish Greek descent herself, and married with the second name Islamol, such a uh, Levantine uh, mix, wrote to me. She said, Ah, oh, they're amazing, they're Greek, unmistakably Greek, even I can tell the first letter A over there on that on that stylized way. And then and then it is Anastasia, Anastasia. And uh, and um, it is Alpha, and then Nu, and then Alpha, and then Sigma, and then Tau, Sigma, Iota, and Alpha. So my grandmother wrote Anastasia in Greek alphabet. She said it's a female name. It means resurrection in Greek. And understanding the weight of information she imparted, my reader also included in her reply me a song poem by the Greek Nobel laureate Elitis, Ena to Helidono. Ena to Helidoni. And this one, Swallow. It's known as the fragmentum uh, sang by Mikis Theodorakis during the resistance to the Greek colonials. And um, it goes, Thermo proto mostora mesestis pascalies kesi, Thermo proto mostora mirisestin anastesi. Last two stanzas of it. My master, my god, among lilacs, my master, the scent of resurrection. As soon as I read these lines, I recall my mother's scent, my grandmother's scent, a slim purple bottle with a golden label from Ferit Ezajipasha of Kemal Alkin in Izmir, the scent of lilacs. Anastasia. What name would she stitch on her bridal sheets but her own? Yet we knew her only by her Turkish name, Melek. Melek means angel. How could it be that my Turkish grandmother, daughter in law of the Mufti in Izmir, wrote in Greek? Once the dominant alphabet and language in Anatolia, Greek has become so distant to us in Turkey now that we find the presence of it in our family almost inconceivable. And it disappeared, it disappeared from the daily life of the city at the end of the 1920s when my mother, grandmother was coming of age. And in the early 1930s, as a young adult, she lived under the terror of government's citizens speak Turkish campaigns. Yet she clearly wrote in Greek. Suddenly, I felt free. Free from my own long obedience to the silence of history. Everything that hadn't made sense until that moment, everything left hanging in the air found its answer. It wasn't that I didn't know, it was that I didn't know what I knew. Like a calligrapher who identifies himself by hiding a deliberate mistake in his lettering when he writes a sacred text, my grandmother too had artfully inscribed her original name, Anastasia, and her bright embroidery aims her floral designs. Shattering the stereotypes of our so-called identity, she, who I thought I knew so well, became somebody I realized never really knew, and I, who I, as a journalist and novelist, spent my entire life finding about truth, I was confident that I knew myself well, had to meet my new self. We are such stuff, as Shakespeare wrote, as dreams are made up. And our little life 
is rounded with a sweep. Discovering my grandmother's Greek signature set me on a quest to find her again and uncover her silent self. Slowly my eyes got used to the darkness of history and I could start to make out the complex identities hidden in its shades. I learned that their destinies are intertwined as the stitches of my grandmother's brotherly angles. Like hers, there are many other silence records of the past that are telltales of the present, inevitably of the future. So my grandmother's secret provided me with a map. To find my answer, I had to visit an island, a town, a city, and a sea. My guide, first of all, was Latuki Dazi, Geographic Administrative Statistics, Descriptive Arizona de Chat Province de Lazio Mineur, by French geographer Vital Quinet. Exhaustive 10 year study of the Ottoman land, population, and economy that provided me a complete picture of my grandmother's parents' world at the time. Little did I know when I first embarked on this journey, Cunha actually, who served as French representative on the Ottoman public debt administration, would become effectively my grandmother's father's boss. So I arrived in Rhodes, just as the midnight celebration began for Anastasia because my grandmother's parents were both in Rhodes. So, uh, this was Megola Sabato, and uh, I decided to find out everything. Everything felt familiar, everything. I mean, the Marguerite Sosu, everything, and my grandmother, as he told us to hit the eggs together, those red eggs, everything. I felt like, there it is, I am home. So uh, then um, I started with the family tree. Family tree basically, actually there is a family tree because my grandmother's mother came from a family known by a tree called Nakka, which is an extinct tree. But other than that, there was nothing, neither in the family tree nor the tree, all around the uh, trees in the roads because I went all around to find them. It didn't, it didn't exist. So I found out uh, when my grandmother's mother was born, in 1884, her name is Nusdiye, she came from a very wealthy family of Rhodes and uh, she had a brother who owned a whole shipping uh, 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 called Pericelli and then even the last descendants of that family was buried in Kremasti as a Greek Orthodox uh, with the name Nuri Basidis. Then I found out that my grandmother's father, Mehmed E. Sheikh Efendi, was born in 1876 in Zuguru, a couple of kilometers away from Rhodes City. And he was educated in um, Suleimania Medrese at the time that Kuhne found his exemplary teaching Turkish, Arabic, Persian, Greek, French, physics, chemistry, etc. And on graduation, he was hired by the Ottoman Public Debt Administration. When I found that out, it was even worse than finding out my grandmother's signature in Greek. My brother told me, can you keep that information to yourself? <laughs> it is still an inflammatory now knowledge to be an officer in the public debt administration of that time. They were sent to Anatolia, first Marmaris. And then I found a record of him in 1905 in Cha. Chao is a town in the middle of Anatolia, which is basically known now as its wine called Chao Karasa, which is a great wine, and also the source of the Muscat grapes in, in Europe. And uh, anyway, at the time, Fuine records that uh, Chao produced uh, 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 wine as well as uh, opium, and it was a hard town. It was then a called the Mirjiko, which is basically the village of the uh, blacksmiths. And uh, in there, in 1914, my grandmother, Melet, was born. This was the year, 1914, the disastrous year, when Ottoman Empire entered the Great War. On the eve of Armenian genocide, the German military arrived in Anatolia, according to the chief of German military mission, General von Sanders with excessive and therefore impossible expectations on the military and economic field. And Turkish nationalist writer Halide Edipadovar identified 1914 as the year in which the young Turk government became a dictatorship 
had it debuted as the forerunner of all the post-war dictatorships in Europe. Nowadays, it is still a tough time, child. Uh, it's the um, ultra-nationalist party, MHP's headquarters, a stronghold, and the uh, mayor, etc., they're all from MHP. And the local officials now insist that no minorities ever lived in Chal. And official population, uh, the, the population office said to me that nobody here remembers anything beyond the last two years. And then there was this, there's this big waterfall where they really now farm um, uh, trout. Uh, we went there and the, he, the, the man who hold the farm said to me, the people here are Uric, if not, they never existed. <laughs> The eldest, my grandmother was a twin and she had six other siblings. Her twin was stillborn, but her eldest sister, famed for her huge length long hair, met a gruesome fate. On the eve of the 1959, I believe in child, other children set her hair on fire with matches. She was consumed by the place. That is when my grandmother's mother stopped speaking completely. And Melek, Anastasia learned the language of silence from her mother. Then, silence became her mother tongue. They must have moved around 1917-1918 to Izmir at that time, and Mehmet Eşref Efendi was appointed the administration of Chamal to Salt Marsh at the time. And they lived in Namazga, and uh, my grandmother was five years old when the Greek troops arrived in Izmir. Uh, uh, they lived just across Agora, the historic Roman market, next to the synagogue of Jewish Muslim Sabbat Izevi. So her father, even though these war conditions existed, continued to make sure that all children in the family got educated, including my grandmother taking private lessons of violin. And, uh, and of course, soon after that, the uh, Izmir was engulfed in the conflagration in September 1922. Still today, in my family, nobody can speak about it. They were there in Amazgha, next to Agora, but as if they missed the whole thing. Uh, so it was so unspeakable, it tied tongues, muted ears, buried the past under the removable ash, language, identity, and memory were slain. And uh, after the war, my grandmother went to the um, fashion school at the time, which was uh, actually uh, called Ecole de Coupe Napolitan. And uh, I think during that time she embroidered this. And this is exactly just after her graduation in 1931, when the nation started discussing this second uh, name law, which is still a controversial law that gives the um, uh, eldest male in the family tried to choose the name of the family. And uh, of course, this, the, uh, the uh, surname revolution basically banned all the foreign names, Armenian, Greek, Slavic, Arabic, Kurdish, endings, whatever. And, uh, and, uh, and my grandmother's father chose the name Özgür, which means free, referring that school sounded like Özgür, but actually, you know, I think there is a meaning in that name. So, my grandmother married to my grandfather, who was actually the son of Müftü and city stop Islamic jurist a year after that. I don't think she ever took actually Özgür's last name. I think she immediately married to my grandfather at the time. And uh, they moved into the uh, two-story house in the garden of historic Hammam, owned by the Müftü's family and her bridal bed turned out to be in a grand room with a high ceiling on the second floor, and my grandmother managed that hammam by the Agora till her death in 1964. Now, as I examine the map of her identity, the puzzle of Melek has become a jigsaw of Levant to me. To my surprise, I learned she was not at all a unique example. As you realize, the earlier speakers talked about it, I mean, these 36 nations that the national histories claim made up the Ottoman Empire, there is all sorts of possibilities in it, from crypto juice to the, everything, hay horons, everything. I'm just impossible to make any uh, symbolization in, in that mixture. And I'm including Anatole. I just realized, I started learning Greek. I, in my first lesson, I realized Anatoly means East, 
which we call Anadolu, which means mother food to us. And then I realized our capital, Ankara, is actually the it sounds like Ankara, Anakara, which is like mainland in Turkish, is Angira, Anker, Anker in Greek. Uh, so, obviously, all the strict definitions of national identities I learned growing up disappeared. And uh, at that moment, I realized that it may be simply impossible to dig out a record from the ashes of the history to find what is the Greekness of my grandmother's comes from. At that moment, I just unearthed my grandpa, grandmother's father's Ottoman personal records. And a surprising new information arrives. None of us aware of it in the family, but his father, my grandmother's father's father, came from Alanya to Rome. Alanya at the time was once the port city of Karamanlı state, which our earlier speakers talked about. So that gave me a possibility. And I realized I learned Melek was actually a common name among Karamanlı. But it is still a dispute today, the origins of Karamanlı. So I remember in 1950s, everybody talks about a meeting between Prime Minister Karamanlı and Prime Minister Menderes, looking at each other and making fun, saying, oh, your name is Turkish. Oh, no, no, your name is Greek. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll say, my first memories of my grandmothers are anchored in the agency, where she taught me how to swim. I remember seeing her through my bed eyebrows, shivering through the blue before a dazzling sun. Those summer evenings were filled with the melody of her violin, filled with nostalgia. But now, I can also not only hear her silence, but also read her alphabet, carefully stitched into her embroidery on her bridal sheets. Anastasia. <laughs> New Levantines were mixed up, but really, you know, we discovered something that I've never appreciated before. Thank you very much.